I'm going to go ahead and call Senate Revenue to order. Uh, Assemblyman Hafen, I'm going to open the hearing for AB 360. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's great to be presenting in front of you um, and the, the committee here today. Uh, for the record, my name is Gregory Hafen II. I represent Assembly District 36. Um, and I, I do have to say I, I, I miss Madam Chair uh, and serving with you on the Assembly side. Um, so it, it really is a pleasure to be here today. Um, Assembly Bill 30, 360 in its first reprint for your consideration would require uh, retailers to utilize an advanced age verification technology at the point of sale uh, for certain tobacco products uh, to ensure that the purchaser is of age. Uh, according to the CDC, uh, while we are seeing decreased use of tobacco and vape products amongst our youth, um, every day in the United States, about 1,600 youths try their first cigarette and nearly 200 become daily smokers. E-cigarettes, commonly known as vape products, have been most used tobacco amongst youth since 2014. Fortunately, the use of these products has dropped since 2019. And I, I do want to just take a brief second um, and, and thank Senator Ratty for the, the hard work that she did um, in the 2019 legislative session because I think that we have seen a dramatic decrease uh, based on her work. Um, a big part of this has also been done by the awareness of the dangers in these products, targeted public relation campaigns and efforts by industry to discourage products among, among younger people. Um, even with this drop, though, uh, about one in every 20 middle school students reported in 22 that they used e-cigarettes in the past 30 days, and about one out of every five high school students reported that they used e-cigarettes. Tobacco, cigarettes, and cigars use is lower, but it still rec represents a significant problem. Uh, retailers have become more diligent in recent years with their age verification practice. Uh, fortunately, new technology is making this process easier, which will protect our youth and help prevent re retailers from unintentionally violating tobacco age purchase restrictions. And this is where AB 360 comes in to require the retailers to use a scanning technology or other automated software-based system to verify the age of the purchaser of a tobacco product. So what is age, advanced age uh, verification technology? Um, essentially, it's an, an identification card scanning tool that pulls limited information uh, from an, a, a photo ID to automatically verify and validate uh, both the age of the person and validate the actual ID itself. To implement this, re retailers only need a 2D bar scanner um, to be able to scan the back of the government issued ID. And most retailers already have this bar scanner um, that they use in their point of sale systems. Therefore, implementation of this age verification component should be very simple. And then technology could be used uh, beyond tobacco products in the future uh, if the legislative body so chose. Finally, we know this technology reduces the visu visual age verification failure rate. It takes the guesswork out of confirming the age of the purchaser, reduces the use of fraudulent IDs, and would require the sales clerk to complete the age, age verification step in order to complete the sale. Um, so what does Assembly Bill 360 do? Um, briefly, the contents of Assembly Bill 360 is very simple. It simply requires the retailer to scan the ID at the point of sale for every tobacco purchase to ensure that the buyer is of age. Um, and as long as there is a, a caveat here that if somebody is over the age of 40, um, they would not be required to have their ID scanned. Um, so in essence, this, this bill basically applies to me. Um, and um, <clears throat> we did add a, a new requirement to add some teeth and a civil penalty of $100 uh, for each offense. Um, this is above and beyond 
um, the current penalty structures or any future penalty structures that may be implemented um, for selling to minors. Um, so this is a, an additional $100 penalty um, if the individual is under the age of 40 and the retailer does not scan uh, the ID. Um, and having said that, um, I, I will open it up for any questions. Okay, so members, any questions on 8060? Madam Chair? Yeah, Senator Keekeffer? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hafen. Appreciate the presentation and certainly what you're trying to accomplish as a parent of two uh, freshmen in high school students and two in middle school. Uh, is the so when it comes to um, tobacco or cigarette paper um, is that the same thing as paper that's sold in cannabis retailers and do they have the same um, requirement depending on uh, what what product is being rolled uh, through you madam chair to uh, senator key uh, the, the marijuana products that are sold at the marijuana facilities are, are um, excluded from this legislation this legislation is specifically to address the tobacco uh, uh, products. Um, in the future, this could be expanded um, and utilized in the marijuana uh, field or the tobacco field. However, um, this bill only deals with the tobacco aspect. Yeah, I, I mean, and there's the age of 21 to, to sell, to purchase cannabis anyway, and they've got age verification systems in place for those retailers. Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't duplicative of what they had to do in order to sell rolling papers in dispensaries. But if it is clear that the intent is not, then uh, that satisfies me. Thank you. Thank you for that. Senator Severs, Ganser, and Assemblyman Hafen, you can just go direct. Th thank you, Chair Neal. Um, so I appreciate, first of all, I want to thank you for bringing this bill forward because I think we're all concerned about sales to minors. And I came in a little bit late, so I didn't know if you were able to tell us how much a system would cost to be able to scan, because you can, you can just check an ID or you can scan it, and what that type of technology costs. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me go direct. And, and Senator Ganser, that's a great question. Um, the, the current technology that's available, um, the vast majority of the retailers are currently using it. It's just whatever they use are using to scan the... Um, you know, sodas or, in this case, the tobacco products for the point of sale, so to actually put it in the cash register, it's the same device that can be utilized in there. Um, what it is is an actual software upgrade to their, their computer system, and uh, the federal government is actually offering that software for free as an encouragement to get more and more retailers to start utilizing this um, new technology for the age verification to try to get the youth um, away from smoking and so the cost for the software is free if somebody is using an old-fashioned uh, cash register that does not have a bar scanner those scanners can cost between hundred and two hundred dollars depending on um, which direction you want to go and which um, actual uh, scanning device you you want to utilize um, I, I did have a conversation with the uh, industry uh, both the association and the non-association members. Uh, there was a, 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 about 10 or 12 of them that I reached out to that were not members um, to kind of see what it would take for them to uh, purchase the, the scanning device and get the software and implement it. Um, they felt that within 12 months, uh, they, could, they could get that all up and running. Um, however, with us living in the crazy pandemic time that we're living in, um, you'll notice in the bill, the effective date is actually not until January 1 of 2023. And that was specifically put in there to allow the, the retailers and the convenience stores and those that do sell the tobacco products enough time to do their due diligence. And uh, if they have to buy the, the $100 or $200 scanner, they can get that purchased. Um, or if they just have to get the software upgrades, it would give them enough time to, to get it implemented and up and running and, and working properly before this would take effect. Um, th thank you. I appreciate that answer. And I would imagine 
to get an eye, a scanner for age identification. That works for alcohol too. So when you're look, looking at convenience stores in a lot of those places, I would imagine they already have that technology or are ready for it. So, and the, the delay till January 1st, 2023, I did notice that is helpful as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Senator Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, not that I am wanting to promote anybody buying cigarettes. Um, my thought process on on um, on this was: What if you have um, folks that are older that don't have ID? Um, so they would have to. I mean, do you anticipate that that's going to be an issue? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. And that is um, that was a concern on the assembly side. Um, that was brought to my attention, and, and that's why we put in here that um, the 40 years. So if you're if you're under the age of 40, the ID would have to be scanned. If you're older than 40, um, you no longer would have to scan the ID because you're you're right that some of the older generations don't. Um, and so this is this would only apply to individuals um, under the age of 40, which still includes me, um, not for very much longer. And that, so, so, but at least, but the under 40 would still have to then, it, and you know, having, um, and once again, <laughs> I don't know why I'm, I'm even asking these questions because I don't really, you know, promote anybody wanting to smoke, but um, I have, uh, at least my youngest has no, had no desire to get a driver's license and he doesn't have, a, but now he does. But I've got a daughter and a daughter-in-law that look like they're middle school kids and they probably will be until they're 30 I mean they're one of them is almost 30 um, and uh, so anybody that's in that thing would probably have to get some but I th are they going to uh, so I guess my question is are they going to um, do some kind of a campaign to show to tell them hey you need to have ID so that they know ahead of time to do that uh, great great question senator and uh, for the record I, I could grow this beard at the age of 15 um, so I have the opposite of problem uh, there. Um, but yeah, so the, with the implementation of the Tobacco 21, there, there's a big push for um, making sure everybody understands the changes in the tobacco regulations. Um, as part of that, uh, I would assume that um, there would be some sort of education. However, um, there is not a, a, an education campaign component of, of my bill specifically. Um, because this is specifically aimed at the retail um, industry implementing the software and just scanning the IDs. Um, I'm sure that the second that somebody walks into the store to buy tobacco products and they're denied because they don't, they'll, they'll learn real quick. Yeah, maybe that'll be an incentive for them to stop. Yeah. <laughs> I, I sure hope so, Senator. Thank you. Hey, thank you for the questions. Um, I don't have any questions, uh, so we will go ahead. Sure. At Senator Ratty, yeah, that's sure. addressing. Chair Neal, I just have, I just have <laughs> one that I want to have on the record just to make sure if it's okay. Go ahead. All right, so uh, the way I read the bill is that the civil penalty of $100 for each offense, that offense is the not using the scanning technology. And by putting that offense in, we are not getting rid of the other offenses, offenses that are within Section 5, which is the $100 on their first violation, $250 on their second violation, $500 on their third violation. And then as we go down farther, the violations for the business that go uh, $500, $1,250, and $2,500. So this is in addition to those. So if they were to sell to somebody who was underage and they didn't scan, they would get the $100 violation for, the clerk would get a $100 violation for first selling to somebody who was underage, and then they would get an additional $100 violation for not doing the scanning. Is that how you understand this would work? Uh, so this, this is an additional uh, fee and fine. So if, if I were to walk into a store after this was in effect and purchase tobacco products without my ID being scanned, the clerk would be subject to only the $100 fine, because I am of age to purchase the tobacco, but I am under the age of 40, so they would have been required to scan my ID. Um, if the individual was under the age, so let's say they were 17 years old, and they went in to purchase tobacco, this would be in addition to the current penalty structure uh, that is already in place under the statute or, or any future changes that may or may not occur uh, to that. But the intent of this legislation is to be in addition to not, um, not a separate 
or not in lieu of it, it, it is supposed to be in addition to. Thank you. Uh, that's how I read it too. I just want to make sure it's on the record. Okay, thank you for that. So we will go ahead and open up for support for AB 360. If you would like to speak in support of AB 360, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once more, that's star nine now to take your place in the queue to speak in support of AB 360. Caller with the last three digits, 223. Please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Brian Badera, B-R-Y-A-N-B-E-D-E-R-A, -E -E on behalf of the Nevada Vaping Association. We are excited today to support Assembly Bill 360. Assembly Bill 360 does nothing but requires people to people who already should be being carded people um, to be carded and ensures that we use the technology that's being used by the vast majority of the industry to card people 100% of the time. At the Nevada Vaping Association, 100% of our members already utilize this technology and have found that it is A, not cost prohibitive, and B, makes it much easier to train employees not to sell products to members or to minors. Um, we encourage the um, quick passage of this bill by the committee and we're proud to support it. Thank you so much. So BPS, really quick, I, I I didn't know there was somebody in the room, so I, I'd like for them to go ahead and testify and support, and then we can go back to the phone line. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Neal, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Elliot Mallon, representing the Nevada Petroleum Marketers and Convenience Store Association. We fully support AB 360 and believe it will help add tools and ensuring that only those legally allowed to purchase tobacco products will be able to do so, helping reduce underage purchasing and ensuring age verification uh, compliance. Also to make the record clear, and I appreciate Assemblyman Hafen saying this as well, other automated uh, software-based systems include age verification systems in use today that rely on computer software or other automated technology to determine a person's birth year from a valid government issue ID and that will help us with uh, compliance and implementation of this. And again, we fully support it, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that. BPS, back to the phone lines. Thank you, Chair Neal. Caller with the last three digits, 200. Please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Bradley Mayer, B-R-A-D-L-E-Y-M-A-Y-E-R, for the record, partner with our Gentleman Partners representing Southern Nevada and Washoe County Health Districts today. Uh, we just wanted to uh, testify in this bill and let everybody know that Nevada is currently in the midst of a youth vaping epidemic, and as such, uh, we appreciate Assemblyman Hafen bringing this bill forward and the amendment he put on it in the Assembly um, because requiring this additional layer of verification will help Nevada's compliance rate and serve as an additional tool to address youth vaping. More will likely need to be done in the future to enhance compliance. But for now, we appreciate Assemblyman Hayes for bringing this bill forward and engaging with us. And we thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair Neal. There are no other callers wishing to offer support of AP 360 at this time. Okay, so we will move to opposition. If you would like to speak in opposition to AB 360, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once more, star nine now to speak opposition for AB 360. Thank you, Chair Neal. There are no callers wishing to testify in opposition at this time. Okay, so we'll move to neutral. To offer a neutral testimony on AB 360, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chair Neal. There are no callers wishing to offer neutral testimony at this time. Okay, thank you for that. So, uh, Assemblyman Hafen, any closing remarks? Thank you, Madam Chair. And first and foremost, uh, it's been an honor to, to present here. This was the first uh, bill that I've ever presented on the Senate. And so 
I want to say thank you um, for that. And, and I have to uh, thank uh, Mr. Malin, Mr. Mayor, and all the other stakeholders that, that helped me get this bill to where it is today. Um, is it perfect? Is it going to end you smoking? No, it will not. I will be the first to admit this will not end it. They will still find ways. But this is a, a huge step in the right direction. The data shows that this is effective um, in, in preventing youth from purchasing the tobacco products. And um, I genuinely believe that this, this will be a, a huge step in the right direction in, in ending our, our vape use and our tobacco for our youth. So, uh, again, I, I thank you all for your time today. Thank you for testifying, Assemblyman Hafen. Sorry I missed you. All right, so we will go ahead and open up for work session uh, while we have all the members, and then we'll, we will return to AB 368. So um, we're going to have two bills instead of three. We're going to pull um, 66, um, and then we'll have that on Thursday. So Mr. Real. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Joe Real, Deputy Fiscal Analyst with the Fiscal Analysis Division. Uh, our work session today begins with Assembly Bill 20 in the first reprint. This bill revises provisions relating to transferable tax credits for film and other productions sponsored by the Assembly Committee on Revenue on behalf of the Governor's Office of Economic Development and heard in this committee on April 29th. Assembly Bill 20 in its first reprint makes several changes to the transferable tax credits um, for film and other productions that may be issued by the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Um, the first four bullet points in the work session document basically uh, make changes to the definition of qualified production with regard to what is included or not included with respect to a qualified production. Um, the fifth bullet point, um, you see the requirement for the office to approve an application for transferable tax credits uh, for eligible productions is removed, instead making the approval of the application at the discretion of the office. The time by which an audit of qualified production must be submitted to the office is changed from not more than 90 days after the completion of the principal production or post-production to not more than 270 days after completion of principal production or post-production, with the ability for the office to extend this deadline by an additional 90 days. The requirement that the production company business address be located in Nevada is removed. And the qualified direct production expenditures used to determine the transferable tax credits must occur during the period in which the qualified production is produced rather than on or after the date on which the applicant submits the application. It also provides additional circumstances under which the office may withhold in whole or in part transferable tax credits that have been issued to a production company. It also establishes requirements for in credits of a qualified production to acknowledge that a production was filmed or produced in Nevada. And there are no amendments, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you for that. Members, any questions on the work session document? OK, seeing Madam Chair, I would, none, I would, I would um, move to amend, uh, I'm sorry, move to do pass. OK, so I have a first, do I have a second? Second. So second from Senator Ratty, um, any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, uh, Mr. Secretary, will you please uh, do the roll call on this? Senator Dennis? Yes. Senator Ratty? Yes. Senator Kikafu? Yes. Senator Sievers Ganser? Yes. Chair Neal? Yes. All right, so we will move to our next bill, uh, Mr. Real. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Joe Real for the record. Next bill is Assembly Bill 69, first reprint, and this bill revises provisions governing economic development. Sponsored by the Assembly Committee on Revenue, also on behalf of the Governor's Office of Economic Development and heard on April 29th. This bill uh, makes following changes uh, to provisions of Chapter 231 of NRS relating to the Office of Economic Development. The definition of motion pictures is amended to include feature films, uh, programs made from broadcast or other electronic transmission, commercials or other audiovisual media. The director of the Department of Business and Industry is added as a non-voting member to the Board of Economic Development. Provisions relating to the board are amended such that, the, that a majority of the voting members of the board constitutes a quorum. 
and the affirmative vote of a majority of the voting members of the board is required to exercise any power conferred upon the board. The name of the Division of Motion Pictures is changed to the Nevada Film Office, and the executive director must be appointed by the governor from a list of not more than three persons recommended by the board, rather than from a list of three persons. The library of the variety and extent of locations in the state, which are available for the production of motion pictures, must be made available on an internet website maintained by the Nevada Film Office. And the requirement that the, reg that the registration filed with the Nevada Film Office be signed by the head of the department or agency authorized to issue business licenses on behalf of a county in a county whose population is 700,000 or more of Clark County is removed. And there were no amendments to this bill, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Any questions on uh, AB 69? Okay, I'll accept a motion. Do pass, Madam Chair. Second, Senator All Dennis. Right, sen Senator Dennis. So I have a first from a, uh, Senator Raddy, a second from uh, Senator Dennis, correct? Yep. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, Mr. Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Dennis? Yes. Senator Ratty? Yes. Senator Kikefer? Yes. Senator Sievers Ganser? Yes. Chair Neal? Yes. All right, so I did forget to assign the floor statement <laughs> on AB20. Uh, it's been a rough week, you guys. All right. Um, I will. So the bill passes for uh, AB 69. I will assign the floor statement to, I don't know, Senator Dennis, uh, and then AB 20 to uh, Senator Sievers Ganser. You All right. Some, you've got some nodding of heads going on. Yes. yes. Yay. <laughs> I figured uh, you had film tax credit, so Senator Dennis, you were the best for that one. Okay, all right, so now we will close the work session um, and we will move to AB 368. So is Assemblywoman Anita Thompson there? The assemblywoman has joined us at the dais. And it appears that you're on mute, Madam Chair. Dang, oh my God. Okay, Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson, you may proceed. Thank you so much for the record. I am Assemblywoman Teresa Benitez Thompson, representing Assembly District 27 in Northern Nevada. And um, I appreciate so much Senate Revenue Committee hearing AB uh, 368 today. So I'm gonna be taking us back in time a little bit. We're gonna be talking about star bonds, one of our most favorite tax increment district financing tools ever. And um, as I prepare to exit in my final year of service to the people of the state of Nevada and the assembly, there were some certain things I was looking back on that I thought, you know, we really should just clean this up before I, you know, before I exit, I'm, um, as a private citizen, um, I'm going to still continue to follow tax reports. I'm still going to continue to follow some of these financing mechanisms. And I realized that specifically the reporting on star bonds is real, wasn't, isn't really easy to read. So we require these reports and they come to us through legislative commission and it's it's hyper aggregated numbers. Um, and so what I was seeking to do in Assembly Bill 368 to make it easier for all of us to read these things as private citizens is I'm de-aggregating some of the uh, data that is being requested to be reported on these bonds for the life of the rest of the bonds. And yes, we still have life on the rest of these bonds. And so my apologies, because what I didn't do for the committee members, I wanna apologize to chair and staff, is I didn't upload um, the, the report that is existing right now that we get through legislative commission. So I'll be sure to upload it for you so that you can see it and reference it. And then the mock-up that our wonderful tax staff did for us 
that would be the new revised version that the language would be asking for. So a couple of things that we learned in the journey when I was revisiting star bonds. One, there were a couple more of these um, star bonds out there than we thought. We thought they initially were all in northern Nevada, but there was actually one in southern Nevada. Um, so there was one that we picked up that kind of um, took us a, a while to know that it was out there. So there was one more than we thought out there. Two, the other thing we learned about this is that just from looking at the reports and the information we, co we collect from the Department of Taxation, we don't easily see what the number of years that are uh, remaining on the bond, the number of payments on the bond, and whether or not those bonds are in kind of a good healthy status. So some of the report I'm asking for is going to just give us better markers about where we are in the life of that project. It's also going to better identify geographic location so that we'll know generally where the area is. As many of you who are on this committee know, there might just be one star bond area that's one business as a proprietary business. So we are not seeking at all to um, have any proprietary information shared. Rather, what we're doing is asking for the report to come to us and describe which bonds, star bonds, are existing in which geographic location. And then if there's just one, perhaps, say, in a certain municipality, then they can aggregate that up to a little bit of a bigger area. But essentially what this is going to do is just help us to know a little bit more about what the money being pledged, the length of the bond, and the location of these so we can continue to follow them out through the rest of the life um, of the, the life that they have in their bonding capacities. The other thing that you will see is an amendment uploaded to Nellis. And I thought, you know, we did, I, I was here for at least one session where we were still trying to do cleanup on the bill sponsors bringing forward language to clean up some of the ways that we saw the reality of how these um, financing mechanisms played out um, in our communities versus kind of the initial thought of, and the intent of how they might play out. And, and I thought we did so much work that to, to make sure that, um, that these things weren't taking advantage of, but it, it probably is a tool of the past that that doesn't quite make sense anymore. So you will see a conceptual amendment that I'm proposing just to go ahead and sunset the authorizing language on this type of tax increment financing mechanism. It's nothing that's being proposed to be used by anyone right now. And if it is, I would argue it's probably from past experience, not the wisest path in terms of the world of tax increment financing that local governments could do. And so it, it, I think it makes sense to propose sunsetting the authorizing provisions. We'll keep the reporting provisions alive so that we can continue to watch these through the life of the, the bonds that are out there. Um, and uh, that's my policy proposal to you folks today and I stand open for questions. Okay, thank you, Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. I'm trying to make sure that your amendment was uploaded. I did get it. And then I know that there was like a different number on it. So we My, went down the. Thank you, Madam Chair. We might need to, um, you're, you're right. I, uh, I think we transposed a number. And so we can correct that and get that to the sentence. But it's um, a big white piece of paper with one sentence on it that says uh, sunset the authorizing language. I saw it, but it, I just, I think that's why it wasn't uploaded because I think it had a different bill number. My apologies, so, but I, Senator. That gets uploaded. Um, it's it's fine, Assemblywoman Benita Thompson. I know exactly what you're trying to do. Um, all right, so members' questions. Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Ekefer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually, um, had a question potentially for our staff um, in Mr. Reel's um, summary of, uh, of the legislation. Um, it indicates that potentially section two of the bill um, would, um, would potentially expose some, some information that is currently considered confidential um, that uh, through the report issued in 271A.105. And I was hoping he might be able to walk me through that explanation because I'm not sure if that's the Assemblywoman's intent or what the uh, what that exposure might be. Uh, 
Uh, Madam Chair, this is Russell Kinden, uh, for the record, Principal Deputy Fiscal Analyst with the Fiscal Analyst Division. Senator P. Kepper, uh, I will try and uh, field that question for you. So if a little bit of history probably to be able to do that is you can see what this bill does. Uh, it also adds the word proprietary. So because as the history of this bill uh, and language that you had the reporting requirements, but there have been off and on the concern about uh, reporting an individual uh, taxpayer's information on their taxable sales, which would then be their revenue. And so um, the, adding the word proprietary then tries to get at, well, you can then release and report that information, but it could still be the case that a taxpayer could try and make the case to the Department of Taxation that that information is proprietary. Uh, and so then the intent here is, is that to, if that event occurs, then subsection three provides the alternative way of attempting to report the information. Uh, and just to, so to provide the context that goes on here with the TIDs is that of the seven TIDs, you have uh, a couple of them that only have one entity in them, such as Cabela's and the Tessera district that has Apple in it. And so when you would be reporting for those, clearly you would be reporting the one taxpayer and their information. So if they would, uh, so this putting the proprietary in is trying to get at, then you can now report that information, less again, that entity would make the, the, the claim to taxation, but they feel that's proprietary and taxation would then say, okay, we won't report. Uh, for those that have multiple businesses, you could still run into the situation where you may not be able to report it. Um, and so then the new subsection three is an alternative way attempting to allow taxation to compile the information if you're in a district where you have uh, multiple business entities, but you end up in a situation where you cannot disclose each individual taxpayer, but then compile the information in a way that does reveal information on taxpayer, taxpayers' taxable sales, but in a stratified manner that does not end up disclosing or allowing you to do, impute any individual business's taxable sales or their tax collections. And that hopefully that got close to answering your question. And uh, through Chair Neal to Senator Keefer. Thank Just you, Madam direct. Chairwoman. To Senator Keefer, I have uh, what we did is a mock-up of three different examples that taxation could look at, all, all of them being less aggregated than the report now, but seeking to not get to the level where you just have obviously the reportable sales of just one individual. So in none of these scenarios do you go below less than two um, businesses. And a lot of it will depend on how you do the taxable greater sales than or the taxable greater sales less than or equal to. So what I'm proposing is more of like a range and then grouping people in, in by that range. Um, so there's, there's a couple different ways to get at it where we know more, but we don't completely um, tie back, hopefully not tie back the, the, the tax revenue being paid to just one specific taxpayer. I appreciate that. So, I just to, so just to be clear on the record, it's not your intent to reveal this new this proprietary information on a taxpayer basis, but to remain um, sort of aggregated or um, de-identified in, in whatever the reports are that come out through this new mechanism. Th that would be the goal in the. Dr Thank you to Senator Keke for Assemblywoman Benita Thompson. That would be the goal in the the drafting of the legislation. Would be to hopefully not be in a spot where you are talking about um, less than two taxpayers. So when we, so when they aggregate it by, uh, by geography, that they can take that into consideration. Um, so we might be able to see things more north or south or by municipality. They've got a couple of different ways that that's the intent is to offer a couple of different ways to look at it, to generate it. Okay, 
Okay, members, any additional questions? Uh, Madam Chair. Senator Sievers dancing. Um, th thank you. I, I think Russell may have mentioned that the Department of Tax would have to, th there may be discussions about what's proprietary and what's not. And so I guess that's one of the questions, whether a business has to come forward and say we have proprietary information and we want to make sure that it remains confidential. Um, I, I could see potentially some back and forth on that. Some, some businesses may not want their information disclosed and they would have to approach taxation before it got disclosed or it would be disclosed, um, w you know, without potentially without their knowledge unless they're aware of this legislation. So I just kind of want to get your, your thoughts on that. Thank you so much for the question. So to um, Senator Severs Gansert, this is Teresa Benitez Thompson for the record. So one of the things that we were looking to do is in the, the report as we have it right now, um, you, you get a couple of different pieces of data points, but nothing's gonna give you an idea of whether you're looking at projects in Northern Nevada or Southern Nevada. There was also, because some of these are, let's say, um, and most of this is public knowledge, so, uh, just like in the, in the same way that we're talking about Cabela's, right? Cabela's is one single taxpayer as a standalone district, but you go over to Sparks and then you have Legends, which is kind of one district, but then made up of a whole bunch of little retailers. And so what we were trying to get at was a report that wouldn't hopefully say, this is report, Cabela's report uh, taxable sales, because that's proprietary. But what we do want to know is for a district, let's say we take Reno, so then you've got a couple of them in there, you're gonna know the amount of pledged sales that are there. You're gonna know for the area, the, the, the life of the bonds that are left. And so I guess what I could, um, so the goal was try to protect as much as we can and not draw, be able to draw like a straight line back. But on some of these, it is a little bit hard because if there's, the, I mean, obviously they are known and this is where it's a little bit different because we do the inverse in, on GoEd, right? When we look at the Governor's Office of Economic Abatements and we're doing tax abatements there, we know specific amounts of taxable abatements and we tie them to a company's name. But on the front end, because it's actual taxable, it's actual sales or their, and the tax that they're paying, that their sales are proprietary. So um, it's a little bit of working backwards in that way. But I guess... Um, we can, I can check back with tax staff because there was a sensitivity to that. So if there's on the report right now, which I can also upload for you, that they fill out for the Department of Taxation, um, I think we could look at that and say what pieces would not, if there was a concern about a piece that they have to put down on the report being proprietary, like their name, their name would not be uh, something that we would want reported um, other than that, I think they only give like right now three or four data points as it is. Um, but I think it was trying to tie it back to saying, oh, now we know exactly what the sales of this company are versus what the, the, the amount that they pledge against their taxable sales. Um, th thank you. I appreciate the efforts for more transparency. I think it's just a little bit tricky because some of these districts have so few businesses in them that it's hard not to disclose who they are by by just evaluating the information. Um, and I think, you know, several years ago when we took out the 2% for the LSSC, I think that made some sense. So I know we've got two more now um, that don't have the LSST piece uh, removed. So thank you. So thank you for that. I know Assemblywoman uh, Benitez Thompson, I know Ms. Hughes was on and uh, Ms. Upton from Department of Tax. Would you like them to address anything? If you have them available, I think we've written this in a way that uh, that allows them the ability to um, have a couple different scenarios in which they can collect information and report it while trying to keep that information proprietary, just depending on the project and the location of the project. But if for some reason they feel like there's a compromising piece, then now would be a good time to, to hear about that for sure. Um, Ms. Hughes or Ms. Upton. Or Director Young. Uh -huh. I didn't see you. <laughs> 
Good afternoon, Melanie Young, Executive Director for the Nevada Department of Taxation. And we've reviewed the provisions of the bill and um, the way we currently do this is this information is self-reported from these in this industry. And we would revise the form um, to allow them to identify if that information would be proprietary. And then when we aggregate that, we would again take a look at the information to make sure we weren't disclosing any confidential information. And I hope that answers your questions. Thank you. Thank you for the commentary. Uh, members, do you have any additional questions? Your Department of Tax? Okay. So uh, seeing no additional questions, I will go ahead and move for support for AB 368. Is there anyone Thank in the room? Sure. Wait, it is there anyone in the room, Senator Ratty? It does not appear that we have anybody in the room who'd like to testify in support. Okay, great. All right, so BPS phone lines. Yes, Chair Neal, the lines are open and working. However, there are no callers on the line at this time. Would you like to take a moment to wait? No, I'm almost positive if they were ready, they'd be sitting there ready to say something. We can go ahead and um, move to opposition for AB 368. Speak in opposition to AB 368. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chair. There are no callers wishing to speak in opposition at this time. Okay, so we'll move to neutral. To offer neutral testimony to AB 368, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chair Neal. There are no callers wishing to offer neutral testimony at this time. Okay. Thank you. So Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson, any closing remarks? No, she doesn't have any, thank you. <laughs> All right, so we will close the hearing on AB 368 and open the hearing on AB 435. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Steve Hill. I'm the uh, CEO of the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you. Wish I could be there in person with you um, and uh, appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, AB 435 is a uh, pretty straightforward bill. Uh, it is uh, related uh, to the commerce tax that was passed in 2015 and a uh, subparagraph here in subparagraph 1N uh, that uh, at the time attempted to uh, clearly define um, both uh, a person uh, that was engaged in an, ex uh, an exhibition. And uh, at the time that intent, at least from the executive branch side, um, was that uh, trade show organizers, meeting organizers, and all of those uh, additional participants, including exhibitors and attendees, um, would be uh, exempt from the commerce tax. Um, that um, was uh, implemented that way uh, for um, several years. Um, but the definition of uh, who is included or what is included in the definition of a person uh, and uh, the definition of an exhibition uh, has been brought into question over the past 18 months or so. Uh, and we feel that it is important um, for all those in the industry and frankly for the state uh, that those two um, topics be um, more clearly defined. Um, the, the industry is obviously exceptionally important uh, to Nevada. Uh, approximately 16, 17% of uh, visitors uh, in Nevada uh, come for uh, meetings and conventions each year. Uh, they are 
uh, our visitors that really uh, help uh, fill uh, hotel rooms uh, during the week. Uh, and it's very apparent now uh, after having not, well, and still really not having uh, meetings and conventions, uh, particularly in Southern Nevada, uh, we have high occupancy as our leisure travelers have returned on weekends, uh, but our weekday occupancy uh, is down around 50%. Uh, in addition to them simply filling hotel rooms, uh, our meeting and convention visitors uh, spend uh, in our state at a higher rate uh, than our leisure visitors uh, and make significant contributions in a number of different ways. Um, our figures, as well as um, others that analyze this industry, um, are that uh, these meetings and conventions support approximately 44,000 jobs in Nevada, over $2 billion a year in uh, wages and salaries, and approximately $6.6 billion of economic impact. And that is the, the direct uh, contribution that uh, these meetings and trade shows make. Uh, if you look at the indirect contribution, um, those numbers go up by approximately 50%. So it's critical. Um, they have also been an industry that has been completely shut down uh, over the past 12 to 15 months and is just now uh, getting back up and running and certainly have um, a, a ramp up period that is going to be difficult. And frankly, we've lost uh, some of those companies and uh, they just weren't able to make it uh, through uh, the pandemic. So they are analyzing every aspect of their shows, including where they will have them. And we often think when we talk about trade shows, particularly when the LDCBA talks about trade shows, we think of the really large ones like CES, and home builders, and broadcasters, and SEMA. Um, but it is a broad spectrum of shows. And certainly, most of the shows do not happen here at our convention center. They happen through properties uh, throughout Southern Nevada and the state. Um, and all of those shows uh, are considering their next steps. Um, this is a critical time, both for the industry and uh, for uh, the hotel and uh, casino industry in Nevada. And the decisions they make now will be um, difficult to uh, reverse if they decide uh, that Nevada is not where they want to be in the future. So uh, it, it's one more step that uh, in the past has not been, uh, this tax has not been implemented on them. As I say, it has been, that question has been called over the past 18 months. And uh, we think it's important that we clarify uh, the situation. And so uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you or the committee may have um, and would appreciate your support of this bill. Thank you for that. Uh, members, any questions? Madam Chair, this is uh, Senator Ratty. Go ahead. So, so my only question is looking on page uh, three. Section N, which is the relative section, right? Um, so there are there are businesses who make a living helping smaller associations to conduct their business. And so I guess my question is, is, is it the intent that this would include a Nevada-based business who serves multiple clients and helping them to organize and manage their trade shows? And I'm looking at the second half, including without limit, limitation, an organizer, manager, or sponsor of such an event. So if you're a Nevada-based business and you make your living helping those smaller organizations put on trade shows, are you included in that? Or is it really to the individual uh, Senator, show? Senator Ratty, Steve Hill, um, the, the intention would be for those businesses to be included as well. Included in the exemption? Uh, Steve Hill, yes, that's correct. 
do you sort out what portion of their business is actually putting on trade shows versus the other things that they do to help support those smaller associations? I'm really thinking of the association management companies. Senator Ratty, uh, Steve Hill. Uh, th th those associations are required to um, segregate uh, their revenue in a number of different ways for uh, several different reasons. They are um, typically nonprofits, so if they do things that um, create revenue that are outside of um, activities that qualify under that nonprofit distinction, um, they are required to separate that. Now, that would be um, a part of their normal accounting and normal reporting structure. Yeah, and I'm not so much focused on the C6 that is the association. I'm a focused on the for-profit company that provides the back of office services to those associations, including managing trade shows. Senator Reddy, Steve Hill, I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, it would, the, the uh, exemption would only be for the activity around um, the trade show itself. Okay. I just want to make sure that that's very clear that this is very limited to managing, organizing and managing of the trade show is your intent. Senator Ratty, Steve Hill, yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? M Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Sievers Ganser. Uh, thank you. I just want to thank Mr. Hill for bringing this forward. I haven't seen him for a while and uh, appreciate the clarification. So again, thank you for the bill. And I think, as you mentioned, conventions will book out for years and years and years. And so we want to make sure we capture as much business as possible now so that we don't have uh, entities relocate and potentially lose them for, for a decade at a time. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, members, any additional questions? So I, I have a couple, uh, uh, Mr. Hill, um, and then I, I, I want to ask some questions to the Department of Taxation. So, so the conversation has been that um, it was originally not intended for um, these trade shows to be included. And there is this conversation, number one, around intent, legislative intent, or the absence thereof. But um, I guess what I'm trying to understand is Department of Taxation felt they were included. And there must have been a legal reason for why they felt they were included. Um, and if that's the case, um, how how do you interpret the way Department of Taxation viewed this already? I could have asked that better, but answer that. <laughs> Senator Neil Seafield. Um, and d d just to be clear, I, I'm, I can only speak, and I was involved uh, with this bill in 2015, I can only speak uh, to the intent um, from the executive branch, it certainly would not um, speak for the legislature or what the legislature's intent was uh, in 2015. But I was um, a part of that conversation toward the end of the session when um, this issue actually arose and uh, subparagraph N was added uh, to that bill at the time uh, toward the end of May. Um, in consideration of this topic being raised in this subparagraph uh, addressing that topic. Uh, th th this has uh, not uh, been uh, implemented or uh, enforced, at least, um, on trade shows for some period of time. Um, the change in that uh, I'd, I'd really leave uh, to the department uh, to answer uh, from their perspective on that. Um, but a part of what uh, created the question uh, was one of our customers uh,
filing a commerce tax return, uh, which I, I think in retrospect, they uh, probably feel like that was an error, um, but it caused the question to be uh, raised. So, I mean, I know there's an ongoing, uh, I guess it's a case, but was, did the, did the trade show or customer or client file because they met the $4 million threshold? Um, Madam Chair, Steve Hill, um, I, I, I don't know why they filed. They certainly meet the $4 million threshold. So I guess, you know, when I was trying to like think through and examine, um, you know, I guess everything that's kind of been the um, conversation around this, you know, I, I was thinking about the statutory construction, right? And so I started digging around and saying, okay, how does statutory construction work in the absence of intent, right? If you say that there is no intent, um, then, Technically, we would look at the plain language and then determine whether or not someone is in or out. And then when I looked at um, NRS, what is that? The NRS, the 360, um, three, it's the, it's a provision that has, I believe it's, let me pull it up. Yeah, 367.80. I was really trying to get an understanding on, um, you know, so if there is no intent and we read the plain language, the plain language seems to say that they they may be um, a, a group of individuals that could have been included. And then when you read, uh, further read into three, uh, 36780, there's a distinguished, there, they distinguish between, um, participant and operator. And so so what I got stuck on was who's an operator and who's a participant because uh, 3780 doesn't wrap them in, um, uh, uh, doesn't wrap in a participant. And so I, I wanna know the distinction here because I do feel that there is one and, and I want it uh, set, a, set out on the record about who is an operator and who is a participant? Madam Chair, if I could, this is Matt Griffin for the record um, with the Griffin Company, and I um, uh, represent the LBCDA. If you could, I, I just like to offer a little bit of the statutory uh, framework for you um, because I've I've uh, looked at this uh, quite frequently. If you don't mind, I'm gonna have to turn my camera off because my my video feed is spotty with it on. But um, for purposes, I direct you for the legal. The legal reasoning behind this, I think you first start with the assumption that a business entity in Nevada must pay the commerce tax um, if they are engaged in business in the state of Nevada um, and if they meet certain criteria. And so in order to uh, be required to be a, um, designated as a business entity in Nevada, the definition of that falls in NRS 363C.020. Um, that's that section, and that's the section that Senator Ganser um, or, or excuse me, uh, Senator Rowdy just uh, referenced that that we are amending. It says a person who takes part in an exhibition held in the state for the purposes related to the conduct of a business is not required to attain a state business license. Um, and then, so if you are taking part, quote unquote, in an exhibition, you are not required to pay a state business license. In addition is the sec section of the statute you referenced, Madam Chair, which is NRS 360.780. That says, that section says, if you are taking part in an exhibition and if the host of the convention is paying the flat rate under 360.787, then that person putting on the convention does not have to pay the commerce tax. So it's kind of a two-part uh, analysis, which is if you take part in a convention and if where you're holding it, if they're paying that flat rate, um, then that the, the the convention company does not have to put uh, uh, get a business license or pay the commerce tax. Um, that's at least the statutory understanding that I have of it. I guess um, so. So staying right there around the flat rate, I need you to distinguish this out. When is you know in terms of the flat rate being applied and not applied to an operator versus versus a participant? I I mean. 
listen, I don't, I mean, you visit trade shows, but, and you see the, you know, the, the people who set it up and then, and then the, the, the operators who may be a part of the space. Um, so, so I really need to understand a little bit more. Can you give me a little bit more information there? Yeah, in respect to the statutory language in 360.780, um, the term operator in that section is referring to the operator of the facility where the exhibition is held. So I'll give you an example. I also represent MGM. So say there is a convention being held at MGM. With that saying, when it refers to the operator, they're referring to MGM. If MGM is paying that flat rate fee under 787, um, and if the exhibition, or, or and if the person is taking part, in uh, the exhibition, then they do not have to pay the, the, the commerce tax, but the operator of the facility still owes that flat rate commerce tax. Um, so I don't think, to your question, Madam Chair, I don't think the operator language here gets on to the people, um, at least in this section, it's not talking about the people that are operating the booths, it's talking about the facility that is hosting the event. And and I guess this so and I guess this is why I'm like super stuck, right? And I know Senator Kikefer has some has a question, and I'm gonna let him jump in. But I'm not sure I agree that the legislature didn't intend for these uh, groups to take part in the commerce tax. I, I so that's my first issue, right? And then and then my second issue is in the in the absence of intent how the legislature or uh, or a court would then view that statute and then think about the history that is present, which is at this point, you guys say there's an absence of an intent, but we knew that the commerce tax was meant to be more inclusive because the whole goal at the time was to create a broader base of businesses and to really try to buffer the state. It was it was a big deal. I was currently sitting on revenue, and um, the conversation was to broaden the base, not to uh, reduce it. And so, and and knowing that intent, knowing that that was the background, and it was an expansion of the business uh, tax. I guess I'm stuck on whether or not I agree that they should be excluded simply because we believe that they should, that they weren't, right? Because I think that if we were to argue about language and statutory language, we could make the argument that they potentially were in and not out. And so I guess that's where I'm stuck. Um, so, and I, and I have some additional thoughts around this because, because I was listening to the conversation about the impact, the 44, what was it, 44,000 jobs and the economic impact that we're talking about. And, and, and the first question that popped up in my mind was, if they were included, um, how would this affect their ability to pay? Because pay the tax. Because what what my assumption is, is that somewhere from 2015, someone believed that they were included. Whether or not they, and if, and if that was the case, then why is the argument being made, you know, the pandemic hit me, I'm being hurt, so therefore I cannot be subject to this. Why wouldn't the conversation be more so, okay, I get it. Everybody got hurt, so let's let's hold off. Let's let's abate you for a while. Let you get your feet under yourself, and then and then this tax would apply to you. Um, why is it just a total exclusion out rather than trying to find the the other way? Senator Neal, um, Steve Hill, a um, couple of things. I think actually the conversation you and Mr. Griffin had illustrates the need for this bill to make it clear. Uh, and that's why we have brought it because there are uh, now different thoughts on that. Um, the, to answer your question, I, I am not trying to say that th this industry 
doesn't have the capacity to pay the tax. Uh, th there may be a few that would feel that way, um, but most would not. Um, what they, what, what I think this bill is really about is Nevada putting its um, best foot forward for an industry that is critical uh, to have return to the state. And having gone through a period of a number of years where we have said that this industry and have behaved as if this industry uh, is exempt from this tax and then changing that position right now, whether that applies immediately or applies in the when the pandemic is over and economics are back, that message will be sent either way. Um, so um, the, the relative risk of uh, losing any of these shows um, would tend to overrun the amount of revenue uh, that these shows would contribute through the commerce tax. They contribute in so many other ways um, from a fiscal standpoint, as well as a job creation and economic impact standpoint um, that we feel like it's important that this be clarified and be clarified in this way. All right, I will let Senator Keefer go. Senator Keefer, and then I'll come back. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. Uh, I think the, my interpretation of this bill has always been that it's clarifying um, my first read on it um, and the way I read it after this conversation remains that um, this is a clarification of paragraph N, which when we originally put it into the bill in 2015, uh, related to an exemption for, for, for organizers of these events. Um, that's why it's there, right? I think if, 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 it, if we didn't mean for them to be exempted, paragraph N wouldn't exist. Um, in the first place. So I, I see it that way. I do have a follow-up question on behalf of um, Senator Raddy, however, um, because she had to depart. And I think it, it relates to um, the question of the, the language without limitation. Um, so her question would be specific to um, a Nevada-based company, right, that participates in um, some of these events, for example, if it's a Nevada-based electrical contractor whose sole line of business is to help set up the electrical in the convention center, right? Would would they potentially be exempted through this, even if they meet the threshold? Um, Senator Keith or Steve Hill, uh, it's not my understanding that they would. The the contractors working on behalf of um, these organizers um, are not. I don't believe contemplated uh, in this language. Okay, and if that's the intent, that's um, sufficient. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Mr. Hill. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I want to ask a question to Department of Taxation. So Department of uh, Tax Director Young, why why did you think that they were these um, trade shows were included in the commerce tax? What was the thought pattern? And what, what legal basis did you believe that they were included? So thank you, Senator Neil, Melanie Young, Executive Director for the Nevada Department of Taxation. The way the Department of Taxation has um, interpreted the section N um, that's subject here is that it was based upon a um, exhibitor, which is somebody who participates only in, as um, for example, would be a vendor, somebody who is a part of that trade show um, that is exhibiting or sharing their wares. Um, and, and so that's how the department has interpreted that subsection in. So if, so if you're interpreting it that way, this expansion without limitation um, of an, because I saw the same thing that Senator Raddy saw, um, organizer, manager, or sponsor, or an exhibitor. Um, you now have the original language is now expanded beyond that space. So what, so what, so what could be the contemplated impact of the expansion? Who's being captured? Um, that wasn't necessarily um, 
probably maybe envisioned to be excluded. So thank you, Melanie Young, Executive Director, for the record. Um, thank you, Senator Neal, for that question. Um, to be able to answer that is, you know, the commerce tax is imposed on the NASIX code. And um, for the example that I would like to provide is the NASIX code that is 561, and that is for administrative and support services. The way um, the NASIX codes are built, there's 27 different NASIX codes for um, the commerce tax. And so what we would view this as is that the NASIX code for this industry would be 561920, and that's for convention and trade show um, organizers. Um, so it would be a further defining just that NASIX code in this industry, um, a little bit further down to that. So when we did look at our records, um, the department currently has 300 taxpayers who are um, registered under the NASIX code 561. Then we um, went further into our taxpayer records and looked at the commerce tax to try and identify the potential exposure um, on this. And so we had to compare um, a couple different data sets uh, to be able to identify those that were truly under the 561 as their um, primary business or their greatest percentage of business in working in this industry. And so we um, looked at that there is potentially seven taxpayers in this record set that could um, meet um, this threshold or this exemption. And are those seven taxpayers, are they, are they considered operators or some other category? <clears throat> Excuse me, Melanie Young, Executive Director. Um, if I could turn this question over to Shelly, I would appreciate it. <laughs> Good afternoon, Shelly Hughes, for the record, uh, with the Department of Taxation. Um, these would be those uh, entities that would be under the NAICS code 561920, which would be convention and trade show organizers. So they would, would they would fall under those establishments primarily, primarily engaged in organizing, promoting, and or managing events, such as businesses and trade show conventions, conferences, and meetings. And so within that, I mean, because the way I envision this, and maybe this is a question from Steve Hill, too. So when we talk about operators, they're just the big guy on top. I think of a, an umbrella, and then I think about subcontractors that fall under. Is that is that a proper way to view that? Shelly Hughes, for the record, Senator Neal, are you asking that question of I'm, me? I want to ask that Steve to Mr. Hill. Okay. Sorry. Senator <laughs> Neal, Steve Hill. Um, so in this umbrella, and you described that uh, correctly, uh, there's typically a, typically a trade show organizer or a meeting organizer. Um, the, the An association can own a show, a trade show organizer can own a show, uh, and then that would... Uh, cover uh, the exhibitors and the attendees. Uh, it would not cover those outside of that group. Okay. And then in regards to like, so if there, if she, if Department of Taxation believes that there's seven operators um, and they've been, and they've been a part, I guess, of what's been going on for a while, I guess I'm trying to, I'm, what I'm trying to break out is how are they, like, what is their revenue? I mean, I know you said it was what, 6.6 .6 billion. Is that like in totality of direct? That's coming from seven, seven operators? Um, Senator Neal, Steve Hill, um, and certainly the department can weigh in on this as well. The 6.6 .6 billion is economic impact, uh, not revenue to um, trade show operators. That is in there, but that is a, 
small percentage of the $6.6 billion. The majority of the economic impact is what the show brings by bringing all of the, we have approximately just slightly less than a normal year, 7 million visitors that come uh, attendees for um, meetings and conventions. Uh, a big portion of those in 20, 25% are the exhibitors themselves. Um, the trade show organizer is typically a much smaller organization. Okay, so so do you know how what's the average revenue for an operator? Like I'm asking you, Mr. Hill. Um, Senator Neal, the, the, the seven operators, I believe, uh, are just simply the seven who have filed. The rest have been operating under the understanding for all these years that this tax does not apply to them. So there are a multitude of meeting organizers and trade show operators and owners um, out there. And they span a very broad spectrum of, of uh, revenue generation. Uh, our largest customers are uh, big publicly traded companies and our smaller customers are just, you know, like any small business. Um, so that, that whole spectrum exists. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And so I'm just going to get down to like the bare bones. Like I understand wh why you guys want the bill, but I guess my, the concerns that I'm having and, and my thoughts of, um, is that, you know, why there wasn't any intent on the record, um, when there was a committee of the whole and this subsection in, I guess, got thrown into the fray and, you know, that my immediate thought was, you know, when there was a big bill that came through the legislature that uh, people really, really wanted, you know, th there were members that were potentially hogtied, prevented from asking certain questions so that they didn't blow up the bill. And so I was, and so, you know, it just begs the question of walking backwards on what is legislative intent because there are other individuals who have claimed that the commerce tax doesn't apply to them. And my general feeling was if I, if this door gets open, who else walks back through the door saying, well, last session, you guys allowed them out. So why not us? And then it kind of defeats the purpose of, to me, what the commerce tax was supposed to be about, which was a broad base of businesses. And so that, that's my, that's my basic concern and issue with the bill. And I'm, and I'm trying to figure out how to get over that. Um, and I'm also trying to figure out how to um, deal with the fact that a executive agency felt that they were included and now outside business is saying, no, we're not and change the law to make sure that we're not. Um, so those those are my concerns and those are my issues. So I don't, you know, so I'll let other people ask questions, but. Madam Chair. So any, go ahead, Senator Keekefter. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I guess if, so we've, this has been on the books since 2015. Um, how many of these companies have actually paid commerce tax, Director? Thank you, Senator Keffer, Melanie Young, Executive Director for the Nevada Department of Taxation. I apologize, I seem to be having a little bit of a coughing fit. But we do have, um, as of those records, there are a few of them have been remitting, where others have been remitting zero tax returns. The Department of Taxation if a business is under $4 million, they only have to check a box and that tax return um, is submitted um, prior to the 2019 session when we um, brought forward SB 4, um, 497 that exempted businesses from having to report. And so um, currently there are a few in that seven that are um, remitting some tax and then 
there are some that are not remitting under, and it is that maybe they're under the threshold. Yeah, or potentially, or that they think they're not, um, that, that the tax doesn't apply to them, right? Because I, I, there are, I, I mean, I, I don't know how, I mean, I'd venture hundreds, potentially thousands of these companies. I mean, if you look at the number of conventions we have on an annual basis in Las Vegas, the fact that a few um, are have decided to interpret this um, to apply to them puts them in the vast minority, not the not the vast majority of these companies and their and their accounts who have who have interpreted it this way. Um, so, I mean, in my mind, everything sort of hinges on the question of whether we think a um, an organizer participates in an event. And I, I don't see how they don't. Um, I, I think that's what they do is the nature of their business. And um, you know, also flashing back to those hearings as uh, um, the, the chair uh, referenced them, um, I mean, there was, there was a lot of material to go through and to get down into the sort of nitty gritty of what we're discussing here today. Um, I mean, we know how legislative hearings go. They don't always provide ample opportunity for that sort of thing. But um, I, I, I again back, get back to the idea that this was inserted specifically um, for this for this purpose, uh, and and believe that um, what we're what we're doing is primarily clarifying the intent as I understood it at the time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, any additional comments? Okay, seeing none. Um, I will go ahead and move in for support for AB 435. Is there any in the room? So uh, the person who is currently in the room, can you come to the table? Good afternoon, Chair Neal and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moratkin, M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N with the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber is in support of AB 435. In the Chamber's perspective and opinion, this legislation does provide clarity to what we believe was the original intent of the commerce tax that did not apply to trade shows and events from our observations and discussions and recollections from the 2015 legislative session. We agree with the remarks made by Mr. Hill from the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority and Mr. Griffin. We believe this clarification is important to supporting our tourism and convention industry as part of our economic recovery. The reality is states like Texas and Florida are aggressively going after our convention and trade shows, and cities like Orlando, Chicago, and San Francisco are also doing the same. We saw this before the pandemic, and they will only continue with their efforts to go after more of our convention and trade shows. We believe this piece of legislation will send the message that we are serious about their convention business and, want, and we want them to come back to Las Vegas. Stability and clarity, is, of course, is always important to businesses. In our opinion, we also view this bill as a jobs bill. This bill will benefit our tourism members and their thousands of workers as we work to recover on Las Vegas Boulevard. Thank you, Chair Neal and members of the committee for your time and consideration today. Thank you for that. Uh, VPS will go to the phone lines and support. Thank you, Chair Neal. If you would like to speak in support of AB 435, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once more, that's star nine now to speak in support of AB 435. Thank you, Chair. It appears there are no callers wishing to speak in support at this time. Okay, so we'll move to opposition for AB 435. To voice opposition to AB 435, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chair. There are no callers wishing to voice opposition at this time. So we will move to neutral. To offer neutral testimony on AB 435, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chair. There are no callers wishing to offer neutral testimony at this time. Okay, 
So, Mr. Hill, any closing remarks? And I will say it was, <laughs> it it is good to see you. I mean, you have a beard and everything, but it was, it's good to see you, even though I'm in disagreement. <laughs> Chair sure, Neal, it's, it's always a pleasure to be in your committee, and I uh, certainly appreciate your time. I'm embarrassed by my beard following Assemblyman Hafen uh, being in your committee. I just don't hold a candle to him uh, when it comes to a beard. Uh, but uh, th thank you and the committee for your time this afternoon. We very much appreciate it. Okay. Thank you for that. So we will go ahead and close the hearing for AB 435. And we will open up for public comment. Uh, is anyone on the line for public comment? If you would like to make public comment on today's meeting, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 157. Please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Hello, Mr. My name is Susan Kaiser, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm making public comment today to ask for your support to really fix SB 543 and support AJR1. Tax abatements as incentives for companies have been on autopilot since the Great Recession. Those decisions brought some diversity to our economy, but it has not been without a cost. School funding took an even bigger hit with IP1 monies for education, voted on and passed by the people, supplanted to pay for other state programs. Since that time, actions to increase funding for education have been rebuffed, with the exception of the commerce tax for categorical education funding. As an educator lobbyist for over 20 years, legislators have told me that, quote, we are broke, end quote, or that, quote, it is up to the leadership. In short, the buck is passed. The evidence is mounting that poor funding of Nevada public schools ha has impacts on our economy. The Funding Commission recently reported that Nevada education funding must be adequate to meet the future needs of our Nevada economy as defined adequate as reaching the national average. Yet on Education Lobby Day, only two weeks ago, few legislators took the NSEA pledge to meet that goal. I wanna thank Assembly Members Anderson, Haragay, and Watts for their signatures. Whether you are a legislator in your first term or in your last, you are serving today and you are serving the citizens of the state of Nevada at this exceptional moment. It is on your collective shoulders to look at funding solutions for education into the future beyond the gift of the rescue money from Uncle Sam. To quote Mike Kazmersky, president of CEO, president and CEO of EDON, Washington cannot fix our antiquated tax system, one that has contributed to education funding's longstanding decline. Wyoming has figured out how to tax their minerals such that their schools are funded 10th in the nation, while Nevada, our schools are funded at 48. That is simply not good enough for our kids. Please, really fix SB 543 and support AJR1 because it needs to be done. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that public comment. Is there anyone else on the line for public comment? No, Chair Neal, the public line is open and working. However, there are no other callers at this time. Okay, so we will go ahead and adjourn Senate Revenue. Uh, members, thank you for your time. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs>